So we'll talk about performance. Like it's very connected to the last chapter that Josh presented. So now that in the first we have to profile to see where are where are the bottlenecks of of our day or 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 code, then we try to improve it. First, Hadley says that we have to be pragmatic. We don't have to spend hours of don't spend hours of our time to save seconds of computer time. The, uh, his approach is to you have a, you define a goal and you only try to optimize until that goal, since it's kind of impossible to get through all the bottlenecks we we found we find. So uh, Hadley has four techniques. There are five that he there are first you have to organize your code then looking for an existing solution do, a, do as little as possible vectorize and then he talks about avoid copies i think he only meant like the four the first four steps but like he also discusses about the the copies as an issues and he talks like this about a general i don't know a, gen, a general method to try to improve the to improve code and he shares some stack overflow inserts that uh, some stack overflow inserts that he that he did that I don't I don't know if you have seen the, these these inserts the links the links in the book but they that you can see that all ev every one of these steps is clear in this in these inserts so like he first creates small functions then he tries to look for the packages or that he copies the code for the existing code just taking out the necessary stuff it's like he you can see there is the philosophy that he tries to improve things improve things so first we start with organize your code the his approach is to write a function like you you have two up you have two or more options of how to solve a problem you each will each uh, write a function for each of them. Now here we can calculate the mean, either of the function mean and with some length. You generate the representative test the test cases like run if you, you generate I think it's ten thousand no a hundred thousand uh, elements, and then you precisely compare the variance with benchmark. Here we can see that mean is much faster is like two times two times uh, the sun and length is two times faster than mean because mean does does more stuff and means is more accurate it does more stuff to be more numerically accurate and benchmark uh, when you see precisely benchmarks take care of a little of that because it ensures that the bo both uh, expressions return the same values but sometimes unit tests might be needed to generalize. So if you have a more difficult issue, we have it's useful to construct some te some tests so you can know that in the all the important cases, the both functions will be equal. Okay. So he also uh, talks about checking for existing solutions. He talks about the context desk views. Did you know about it? The this current text desk view. I didn't know about the sites. It seems very useful. Like I saw one of the questions, like with the one of the exercise of LM. And if you go like to high performance computing, it has a lot of packages that deal with parallelism. Parallelism. If you look like LM. You have like the H H two O, and you have the big LM. You have you have a lot of pack packages like for the for those that the, that implement LM looking for big data for parallel parallel for parallel structure. I think it's I didn't know about the site and it's, it's very good. It's like it's how do I go back? Okay. It looks very good and it gives it gives you a, a summary of everything that is in Chrome. So he, the, he, also, he also talks about the 
looking for projects that has RCCP as a dependence because it means that the package uses C code to which usually is faster, much faster than R. And also talk to people like on Google or the R4DS community, ask about uh, other packages, faster packages or implementations. Then he talked about do as little as possible. I thought this is interesting because it was like the whole book, he also talks about you as a developer make uh, the user have little effort, but if the user has little effort, the code has to do a lot of things. The code has to check a lot of things. The code has to, even, even when we will build classes, also like you have to build a helper that does a lot of tests, that does a lot of, yeah, does a lot of tests, that does a lot of checks. And, it, and it's like the opposite. You have, it's like a trade-off. If you have to do something good for the user, you have to do a lot of things, but if you have something to be fast, you have to do little. But okay. So use a function tailored to, so he talks about uh, looking for um, a specific function that is more useful to your case, something like row sums or cosines, th then using apply. There are uh, vectorized functions that are made for, because like apply is made for be general, generalized, and these functions are made to be fast. So v apply and c uh, supply. A supply it's it's like it tries to make the result as simple as possible, but via apply you have via apply you have to specify the output so it's faster. And this example, if you if you use any and ten in X, this will be faster because in testing equality and in much faster than testing this. And it also talks about situations when you, you input the data but it be closer to another time. Base R does this a lot of, a lot of times it love matrix is try to score several things to matrix. And one example is apply. Apply always, always coerces the data frame to matrix. It, I think it's one of the reasons he talks about not using apply because if you have a character column, all your data frame will be characters. Some other tips is like to always specify the column types in read.sv or factor some to you, you give the levels to factor, cut with labels, labels equal false, unlist, use names of false, read unlist, interaction, drop equals true. This one, I think this one is read.sv is a little tricky or read, read underscore csv. I, I think reader underscore SV usually is faster, but sometimes it's not. You have some, like I remember sometimes because here in Brazil have the, the comma is used to numeric values and not to separation. If, if you use read, read, dot, read underscore SV, it, if you use read dot SV, it just throws an error. But if you use read underscore it, it tries to guess the, the type is the whole thing. And okay, so we have, we'll see some examples of doing little as possible. One example is to avoid method dispatch. Like if you call me, me will first try to see the type of the object and then the usual, and then dispatch the, met, the, the method. And then we can just use mean.default. And we'll just say that we use the, the method for numerical values. Or you can use the internal C function dot with dot internal. We can try this tree and you can see that every time we have some gain speed, at least for any small vector. If we have a big, big vector, the difference in speed is not very, not very large because the method dispatch, it only happens once. It doesn't take a lot of time. So it doesn't, the, the game doesn't grow with the, with the, with the object. But you also have to take care, to be careful that the method dispatch, method dispatch is an important part to, 
I don't know, two for safety. Yeah. Because if you have the it if you give them it, if you give them method right away, you are ensure that X will X has to be a uh, in numeric. If X is not a numeric, it will have it will turn around weird errors. It's not like it's not the error like that that method would realize. It's like it can be a really weird error, weird error. So another way is to avoid input coercion. His example is S dot data frame. That it is slow because it coerces each element into a data frame. Like here we have a list of vectors. Okay, here. What as well dot, dot data frame would coerce A to a data frame, B to another data frame, C to another data frame, and then it would bind all these data frames together, which would take a little time. We can be the, we can create a function that will only uh, change the class of the object to, a, to the, a data frame, and then would you, would you create the attributes row names. So uh, the, yeah, the row names would be the row names. So you will create uh, a list of letter, uh, list of letters, and here you can see our list, our list of thousand vector, thousand, thousand values. If we benchmark both of them, we can see that, yeah, the quick DF is much faster. Like, I would say it even changed the, the unit. So quick DF, quick DF is like a, about a, a thousand times faster, like give or take. And quick DF, and quick DF was created looking from the source code that as dot dot data frame like he look he looked at the code of the data frame he saw okay this is the part that i need and he took out the rest so this is a much more specialized functions but it only works with a list of vectors that has the same that have the same length very specific okay another example is vectorize vectorize you basically finding our functions that are implemented in c and most closely applies to a problem. Some of them are row sums, call sums, row means, call means, uh, vectorized subsetting, like the one of subset, regular subsetting, I don't know what is vectorized, but is usual subsetting R is vectorized. You can use cut and find interval to find continual variables. You have come sum in diff, or you can use matrix algebra, which is not very easy, but is an option. And I th think he talks about matrix algebra because there are like there are like a lot of packages that that optimize uh, matrix algebra. Like it's, you can easily find packages that that optimize this kind of operations. Okay, the, but okay, the, it's not like it's easy to find the packages, but it's not easy to understand matrix algebra. So you know, there is that. And here is an article about the vectorization in R. That talks about my about the idea that vector, why vectorization is important, why it is interesting. So the the he also discusses about avoid copying, and the thing that mostly the problem with copying is like allocation of in memory that takes time. Like he they talk he talked about it in the first chapters. So it. Here we're trying to pay. We create uh, we create random strings like we create ten random strings and a hundred random strings, and we are collapse them in one big string. First he first he uses the function paste, but in a for loop, we 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 loop over the function, and pay and will be we like will grow each time we will grow a vector. And you can also use space that already is a vectorized function. Thing is, space and the space version is much faster than the, than loop than the loop, and it, it scale much much better. Like if you go to here to here, you have like I don't know five. 
I don't know, I think about six times, six times larger. And here is like about six times. You have a vectorized function usually scales much better because they don't have to, like each time you have to allocate the out vector and each time you will be allocating a bigger vector. Like it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of work from the, from the machine. And here, and last, and last thing is a case study with the t-test. There is a test that basically compares the two things. Basically, yeah, it's a new statistical test. The thing is, it's a little different. He used the system time and not bench because it's from an article about statistical tests, trying to compare them and trying to see how to make them faster. You have a thousand of observations of 50 patients, and I will take fifth. We have a hundred rows, six columns, and the columns they belong to two groups. So we have so we run the t test and it uh, a thousand times. We run the t test and each row. We can do this with a four. We use the four over the rows, and you can use the a formula interface with the groups. And you can use and you can pass the vectors directly. You can pass the group, the two groups directly, which is much faster, a little faster than. And but we want to make this even more faster. We can first, I know, first we have to save the values because the for loop does just calculates them, calculates in, in print, and now use per to save the values. For some reason, per, ah, yeah. Per is about the same time. I think the system, not, the system time doesn't have, doesn't print a lot, of, a lot of numbers, but like, it's just a little faster, but no, no much difference. To speed things up, we can look at the, we can calculate the t-test like by hand, using the, you calculate the mean, the length, the variance, and then you calculate, and then you calculate the, the t statistics, which is like this. You just calculate the standard deviation, the difference between the their means, so uh, above the total standard, standard deviation. We, again, we have, it's a lot, a lot, it's a lot faster than the other approaches. And we can, we can make it a more faster if we remove the loop. Now we don't have a loop, now we don't need map anymore. We now, now use row means and cause row sums. So like t tests will, will, will only run once and get all the values you need. Then we can calculate the, the final values, which it takes like zero time, which is not zero, but it's just to show that it's, it's much faster than using the, the, the other approach. It's just like trying each separate at the time. First, like uh, taking, just doing the work, not like all the tests that the function does. Then we vec you use the vectorization to be to make it even faster. Okay, and that was it. I was trying to come up with an example. I was trying to do some code code that I was working with, but I was problem. I found like too many bugs in the code. I was like, okay, I I just gave up. Stop sharing. Thanks, Jorge. Uh, that was awesome. Um, yeah. Um, what do you all think of the chapter? Like, one thing I thought was that there's a big part of like, like that I don't do very well of like uh, planning, like code, like planning an approach. Like, I just kind of like dive in a lot of the time and just like stuff looks super messy. And then like later on, I like do the things he talks about, like organizing it or like writing as little as possible. But I often feel like 
it's kind of hard to do that without writing a lot first, you know, or like writing something that looks not as great first, you know, kind of like writing an essay. I don't know. It's, uh, I, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I, I know you played with um, Advent of Code, and uh, when I've tried to do that, I'm quite often wading into uh, unknown territory in terms of a task and trying to find a solution. And sometimes it's a horrible solution, but it does work. And so I get into bad habits of um, finding something that's very inefficient, but it works. And I know that I should probably go back and figure out the right way to do it. And that's where sometimes I'll just cheat and look at other people's code and say, ah, okay, now I get it. That's that's a much better. It's more vectorized. It's uh, it's it's more elegant. Um, but I'm kind of like you in, especially in a challenge like that. That's so it's supposed to be somewhat time dependent, and you're 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 competing, and you're just trying to, um, you know, get an answer as quickly as possible, even though it's it's a bad answer. Yeah, um, I'm very similar in that usually the first time I'm doing something, I don't have a preordained plan. Um, and it isn't until I find some time where it's either uh, memory or time exhaustive to run a section that I'm actually worried about performance uh, or it's a production piece of code, right? And then I have to go back, but usually I'm not thinking of it ahead of time. So maybe if I was always thinking from a production mindset, if that was the first iteration of like, if it was code that was only going that way, then maybe I would, I would but probably still like an essay, I would sketch first something that I know works and then build off of baseline. Um, I was using some of this to try and fix some problems I had uh, today. And um, I like using bench, you know, like having and trying multiple candidates. It's cool. I was using it more for memory allocation because uh, I was trying to see if, I could make something use less memory in a Docker container because um, I have Docker container constraints. And so I was trying to make it so it wouldn't blow up the container by being too memory exhaustive. So, uh, but I think it follows a lot of the same things that he was saying there, which is to you know speed things up uh, or to you know just be more mindful of how you build it and use less if you can, rather than make, you know having something too encompassing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was wondering if like anyone, if any of you like actually like did like do pseudo code or like sketch out, you know, like some kind of outline, like, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't know. It just feels like sometimes I just get like too excited and I just like want to do it, you know? And like, I'm like, Oh, I think I can do it. And you just like, duh, 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 duh. and like, I learn by like doing something wrong. Uh, and like also, I feel like whenever I hear like Hadley Wickham talk or like David Robinson or something about coding, they're always saying things like, um, you know, if you find yourself writing something three times, turn it into a function, you know, like, and like, you can't, it's hard to know that without doing it, you know, like, uh, so it seems like some people are like very inductive and like about their approach. And like, I feel like right now I'm very, you know, bottom up, like with it. Um, so, yeah, I think some of that comes with a lot of pain and headache and, and experience because, you know, the more time you spend debugging something and being like, why did I ever write this like this, you know, and it's not easy to fix and the, you know, then you realize that making it smaller and, and, um, you know, in a functional form from the beginning was maybe the right approach because then you can at least find your bugs fast and you can work on that, you know, modularly on performance. Uh, which I think he's pushing us to, like this chapter was a lot about smaller items of code, sections of code, but it was still definitely about like, let's build performance on this very discrete thing rather than on, you know, a whole big thing. And, and don't spend too much time on that discrete thing, but that's what you're trying to improve, right? And hopefully if you improve all of your little things, your big thing improves. I don't know if I've ever, and I ask you guys if you have had needed speed speed ups in the amount of speed that he was talking about here, 
you know, like I've never thought about, let's take the, all the safety equipment off of, you know, my internal stats functions, because that's how it was a speed up I need. Like, I've never thought of that as something that was uh, the time suck for me. Like not use as data frame or whatever. Yeah. That, that would be tough. I don't know. Uh, like, I feel like a lot of the stuff that makes it faster is also, it kind of, for me, it, it takes away a little bit of the benefits of using R. Like R is so like understand, understanding, it seems like. Like when you, like when you go to a, other, a lot of other language, you have to like predefine types and like, like set variables up before you do anything to them. And, um, and like with R, most of the time, you just like do something and it tries to guess and it usually guesses right about like what you want in the end, you know, but like, but I think that this, from this chapter, it, that like that comes with a cost, you know, performance. And um, I was like playing around with Julia a while ago. And like the biggest thing I noticed, and it's, it's a lot faster than R in a lot of things. And the biggest thing I noticed was that uh, everything you do, whether it's a function or a variable, like everything has a type, you know, that you, set up right away you know every argument you put the type right next to it and like i think that's one from reading about it i think that's one big reason why it's faster um but like how fast is it to write that code i don't know <laughs> like uh so um not hating on julia or whatever but or any other language but like just seems like it's a trade-off in some ways yeah yeah i'll take the safety blanket of our <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was, I was also, it reminds me, uh, I was prepping for a presentation for the Tiny Models book club last week. And um, they talked about their philosophy of like human centered, like code design. Um, and part of that in the Tiny Verse like book was that um, uh, part of the, what they said was like, they get something to work and like they get something to work in a way that like people can use it. And then afterwards they figure out how to optimize it, you know? Um, how to like speed it up and I don't know I thought that was interesting um, like I think a lot of people's first goal in like writing our code isn't to like make something faster you know unless it's like rewriting our code you know um, yeah and and maybe that's part of the where it is with for Hadley is very different from the mindset of you or I so mm -hmm. go ahead Hori oh I was talking about the, the time mode and he said that he, the type models that you first have to make things uh, useful, then you have to make things more optimized. And it's like if, if you see all the stack of flow answers, it's like, oh, tidyverse deploys is so slow. Or, or the old answers have this all the time. It's like the price is low or type low when you don't see there's a lot more. They Once they did like the foundations of the of the of the functions of the packages they kept a lot they try a lot to optimize it like I I think I saw once the release notes and a lot of the more recent release notes are about optimizations like literal optimizations here and there here and there to make code faster Yeah, the, the other thing I was thinking um, was about the vectorization point. Like, um, like one, it feels like that's like the biggest difference from coming from other languages. Like for people who start learning R is like avoiding the impulse of writing loops for everything. Like, um, uh, I don't know, but I didn't really, I, R was kind of like the first place I started. So I didn't really have that, but um, uh, what was I going to say? But there was a thread on Twitter the other day about like, but it was about like a Python perspective, but it's the same topic, like why vectorization is fast. Um, and I feel like I, were, I was trying to find the thread and I couldn't uh, just now, but um, there was something about, like, I know you mentioned Jorge about like the difference when you're doing like a loop versus like, a, like you're not copying every, on like every iteration, you're not like recopying the, the object. But I also think there's something about like how it's allocating memory, like, I don't know. It was in thread they were talking about like uh, something about how like it's it's kind of like par parallel parallelizing, but like not across cores. Like I don't, I don't know. I need to look at it again. Maybe it's about threads or something. Um, 
but uh it, it was just kind of interesting and i i want to understand it more like um yeah i mean I, I think it's kind of like um if you have a kitchen and you have orders coming in sequentially right like you you start to serve them and and figure out what you're going to do to cook one after another uh, and that's how your computer kind of works versus if you've got them all at the same time i got 10 orders i'm going to try and figure out how to optimize the utility of the kitchen to make those 10 orders let's say your your computer can process and understand like how to basically pre-schedule and serve everything mm -hmm. to be faster right when you have all of the stuff at the same time so maybe that's threads and it's so simple as that and my analogy is a little over complicated but that makes sense yeah um I guess this is the first chapter with uh, with exercises in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. I, I surprisingly didn't find them that complicated though, so I was I was happy to actually be able to answer them. Mm -hmm. um, I did like uh, the uh, Our Inferno. I don't know if I'd seen that before. The book, the like with the circles of hell for R. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah i, I want to read that um so i want to uh, purchase is something you have to buy or is that a free online no no that was just like a pdf um there was one that you had to buy i think but like there was like an amazon link for it oh yeah i see it. i see the pdf now cool yeah um, did you did you look through it at all I looked at it a little bit and it's, it's some of the stuff is the same sort of things that we were discussing. So it's kind of like, um, yeah, it was like vectorization is, um, is important. Growing objects is important. Um, don't vectorize more than you should, um, uh, use functions. Yeah. Object oriented coding. And then I think it's a lot of examples of like when things don't do what they're supposed to do. So don't trust R to do exactly what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, it seemed like it at least came from like an honest place, but it was written in 2011, which worries me a little bit because I would imagine almost all of the packages and functions we use have been at the minimum updated since 2011, if not are much newer than that. So. Yeah, I was actually trying to when trying to find that post about uh, vector vectorization, like in Python, uh, the Twitter thing. I found a Stack Overflow post that was talking about a similar topic, and they were like, they basically the top answer had to like uh, be updated like three times. It was like it was like oh, the reason why vectorization is faster in 2013, and then like the reason why it's actually faster, much faster in 2017, and like and like as the technology changes, you know, like the code operates differently. It's kind of cool. That is cool. Um, yeah. Did you all see that link I put on there, this uh, benchmarking? Uh, it was, I think it's kind of relevant to that slide uh, about um, like reading in data. Um, let me just, it's okay if I share it. Yeah. Um, that was pretty interesting. So this is like H2O AI. Um, they're doing all these benchmarks and like Python and R. Um, and I actually saw it because uh, I went to that Apache Arrow talk and then I followed the guy who created data table. And he was like, actually like Arrow didn't like do the test right. Uh, like they, like we added this, like the reason why it was slow before is because of this like option about strings or something like that. And then now we changed it and it's like, it's much faster it's or it's faster for that data set um but it's i think it's kind of neat like you can see like you know like half a gig like what the times are and like you know what's competitive and whatever um and then you go to like 50 and like dplyr has an internal error you know <laughs> like when you try to like uh group by and summarize um that is pretty yeah, interesting. that makes sense <laughs> some by id let's see uh yeah 10 million rows uh yeah they have all these like tests uh and apparently he was saying i was watching a little bit of a talk about it and they were like saying how 
uh, they run every test twice because um, the first time for a lot of functions, like the second, sorry, the second time around, a lot of a lot of like packages do stuff with caching and things like that. So if you run it again, it like has differences in performance than like running it the first time. But I was like really surprised to see like Spark like down here and like data table is just like anything you look at pretty much. I mean, the guy who made wow. this like, made data table, but right. uh, <laughs> so, you know, uh, I don't know. I feel like that might be a little bit like, like reading studies, you know, that are like funded by like the drug, drug company or whatever. But still, mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to argue with some of these. Um, and I guess this is like a 2014 version or something. I don't know what that means. Um, where like everything fails except for data table. Um, so uh, that guy, uh, Matt Dow Dowell, mm -hmm. uh, who um, oh, he'd had a, um, a data camp tutorial on data table that I always meant to, uh, to go through because it looked interesting, but I didn't. And then I dumped data camp, you know, when everything uh, hit the fan. Uh, and um, then later, I kind of saw that uh, that guy, Matt Dowell, was kind of, um, he felt like his, his uh, package had been marginalized by everybody flocking to Tidyverse and DeepIR. Yeah. In fact, I kind of remember there was this, on Twitter, there was this sort of public, um, I mean, it wasn't really bad feeling, but uh, Matt and Hadley were going back and forth and Hadley eventually said, you know what, you're right. You're, you know, your package really should be more front and center. So let's figure out how to get data table um, more, um, more publicity. And in fact, I think Hadley collaborated on a cheat sheet of data table to try to promote it. Mm. That's interesting history. Um... I, it's funny because like I would then time I don't use it regularly, but then times I've used data table. Um, like I didn't even really think about the fact that like I was using data something a data table object and then like doing like tidyverse type manipulations to it afterwards. Like I just assumed that it would just like work, but I think those are like have to be built in, right? Because it's like a different type of object and um, or it's doing some kind of coercion on it mm -hmm. right so maybe i was losing the benefits of like the data table format but do you guys ever do you guys use it like regularly like this f read and stuff and uh i was trying I, to use it today to fix something but it didn't end up making it any better for my memory use mm. i i should probably try it uh i mean I, I have to learn the syntax of it but right now i've got this um markdown of uh coronavirus uh, cases in Mexico that is um, kind of taking mi a minute or more to <laughs> uh, just to read in, and I don't know what the um, what the bottleneck is there, but I think it's pretty universally accepted that F read. If you're dealing with tens of millions of lines, F read is the way to go. And and like, you know, you know, Kevin, the the link that you showed pretty well backs backs that up. Mm -hmm. Is F read fast read? Is that what F is? Or? That's my understanding. Uh, my understanding is that in terms in terms of uh, of, I mean, dplyr is great if you're dealing with hundreds or thousands. But if you're getting into millions, you you really owe it to yourself to be looking at F read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I need to learn more about like the syntax, like if they have something that like, like, cause like, I don't know, I, I feel a little bit of like, like, I don't know, not, not like sickness, but like, I feel a little like drawn away from like stuff that looks like base R now. <laughs> um, and like this syntax, like, you know, I mean, it's probably great. And I, I, I just, I need to get over that, I guess, but, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the verbs are a little confusing sometimes. That's, I, I use it in this code for a couple of places to speed up some things and it's it, it's just kind of frustrating. Um, one thing it does though is it sets indices uh, well so you can 
um, filter and group by are like a lot faster uh. because it basically presets the index for it. So instead of going and finding the things, it, it pre figures out the things for you and then just grabs the right stuff. Like it already has the indices defined. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that to me has been the only utility I've really used it for and, and thought was um, easy enough to like hack in there. It sounds like from what you said a second ago though, that like, like it'll give you speed advantages, but it's the same kind of like footprint, like memory wise, is that right? Yeah, that will, at least in the case I was trying, I was having a problem where I was trying to turn something that was quite large into a sparse matrix to be passed into a, a regression. And it was causing chaos in the in a sparse matrix formulation. It was reading too much data in. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, I wonder if there's like packages that like coerce, coerce like tidyverse code to data table or something. <laughs> I've, I've made that same search like several times looking for data frame to data table. And I'm like, oh my God, I, it never, it's never as easy as I want. Like, why can't there be like a translation like DB plier, but for so, D, DT plier? Oh, what's that? Oh, wait, wait, you're holding up a cheat sheet? Oh, sorry. Right, yeah. So if you go to our studio, you can actually download the data table cheat sheet. And I don't have not mastered it, but I have it printed out. And one of these days, I'm going to figure out how to how to be able to, to uh, balance between dplyr and, uh, and uh, data table. Oh, here we go. Oh, data camp. Oh, we don't want that. Oh, no, 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 no. No, it's our studio. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, in my old office, I used to have like like ten cheat sheets just like on the bulletin board. Oh, um, oh there we go. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I'll print that out. Um, group by yeah, cool. Ooh, oh that's interesting. So you chain square brackets. That's weird. <laughs> I mean, you could chain square brackets now, right? Like you can do an index on an index. That's kind of a base R thing. I, I do that a fair amount, but yeah. yeah. It's also very dangerous to do like square brackets on square brackets because you're taking indices of something that's already subsetted. Yeah, I feel like it might be hard to follow the logic. Like if I were yeah. like reading it three months later or something. Yeah. Um, but it's the same problem though. If like, I sometimes write like, uh, tidy, tidy like chains that are, you know, uh, like a, a screen length long or something, and I, I don't think that's good either. Uh, um, You're probably supposed to be using functions at that point in time. To yes. Cut things up. Probably, yeah. I speaking of, I started uh, using that targets package, and it's pretty cool. I, I like rewrote, uh, kind of refactored some code that, um, it, like, it was relatively simple. Uh, but it like had a couple things at the end that were like outputs that could be done in parallel because um, they were all dependent on like the same, they were independent of each other, but dependent on the same CSV or whatever it was or SQL output. Um, and it was awesome. Like, and I, and I actually started to like, um, like, so I, I don't know if you guys, uh, I don't think I mentioned this in the meeting, but I posted on Slack afterwards. So I don't know if you guys saw a link, but it's this, uh, if you guys, if you guys have ever used uh, Drake, um, we ever use Drake? Uh, it's like these pipeline tools. Um, so basically, you're like organizing like chunks of code into functions, and then like you kind of orchestrate how those functions like are related to each other and like how they are linked. And it um, it's easier if I show you uh, this, but um, I was mentioning this in another group I think too. But basically, like if you have like you know you basically uh, make every like step in your data set, however you like to define that, is like a function. And then you have a targets file that like you put those in the name of that step and like the function that happens that is executed that step. And then based on how the names are linked, it like generates uh, oops, like a code. Uh, shoot, I have to zoom, I hate this. Uh, cool. oh. <laughs> oh, annoying. Uh, 
yeah so like you see like th these these are dependent on each other this happens for this and then like the last two the fin and the histogram plot can like happen in parallel and like you can like it'll like automatically like you could say like i want to use four workers with this or whatever and it'll like use those workers and like parallelize like code and i was using it and like and like i, I was like oh shoot i want to update like this me intermediate step and like and i did it and then previously I would have just been lazy and like reran all the code and like it would have like taken a while and it would have been terrible. But like it just cache caches everything and just like reruns the stuff that you changed. And it's like the coolest thing. Um you know. that's very cool. Yeah. Um and then you can like it just, just I just like there's so much I want to get into with it, but uh kind of reminded about it today. Um you can do like two like stuff. I don't know if you guys are getting bored of this but like like dynamic branching so like if you have a, a architecture or whatever of like functions and then you want to like do that thing to like a bunch of objects you can like map over that and then it'll automatically create like a bunch of branches for every like uh everything you're mapping over um that you're iterating over and like uh i think it's pretty awesome um but anyway uh, that's oh, super cool. And and the last thing I was I was gonna say about it is like with memory, it's interesting. Um, it like so like it, it saves every single step is like a cached like object like in the directory, but it's like not. I don't think it's the same like memory impact. It doesn't seem like it. Uh, I might be wrong about that, but like you can like and then at the end, if you want to, after you've ran the pipeline, you can like you can like uh, say like uh, I think it's like tar like uh, like get or something like that and you can like bring that object into your environment and like do things to it um but uh yeah anyway and i just like i was uh oh yeah this is the re real reason why i thought of it though um with like the organizing the code bit like i feel like if i start doing this for a lot of code like if i do it from the beginning maybe you'll like force me to outline it you know because like you have to the end product oops the end product is like these um uh and product is like you know this the set of the set of functions that are like chained together so maybe like i'll start thinking in that way i don't know but yeah. yeah that's really cool i think you have to make sure to make like small enough steps right and like not make too big intermediate functions otherwise um you know, like you could, you could have five things chained together or you could have two, right. And then have the, yeah. Yeah. yeah so like, the, I think, uh, no, yeah, the th like that I think helps in a way, like just forcing yourself to do that. But also, um, like when I try to refactor this code, like into this pipeline stuff, like I actually realized that there was a bunch of stuff that I was doing that like could just be outputted right away. You know, that like, that like I was waiting until the end just because like I thought of it and I put it at the end of the script. But like, if there's a part of the script that takes an hour and there's a part of it that takes 15 minutes, you should get the result for the thing that takes 15 minutes right away, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I just like didn't even know that, like until I looked at it and like started to break it up. And then I was like, oh, like, um, you know, like uh, uh, this is just totally independent of everything else. Um, so, is there anything else you guys want to chat about? I'm like, kind of just no. I just want to be on the screen here. Yeah, thanks to Jorge for uh, doing the presentation and also for the link in the chat. And uh, yeah, Kevin, I appreciate the benchmark uh, comparison you you set up as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Jorge, have you have you used that uh, that like um the the uh what do you call it the um the cran uh tasks view like for what I, at all? I just found out about it i think i saw that page once or twice but i never look at much into it mm -hmm. yeah it kind of reminds me um uh i know we have only a couple minutes but there's a um data visualization uh functionality or something like there's like a way you can um it's a website that uh 
Maybe I'll just find it later. Um, I think that's really might be on my GitHub. One second. But that like organizes uh, data visualization by like by like type of thing you're doing. Um, uh, sorry, one second. Uh, this like here, so like you can search by function or you can search by type. And so if you search by function, oops, uh, I guess there's ads. Um, but like you like, it's like you want to look at proportions or like parts of a whole or like a distri distribution or like movement or flow or like patterns. Like it's organizing by like the thing you're trying to see or do rather than like the type of plot. That is like it reminded me of that 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 resource if you want to do movement or flow you might want to look at like a sankey diagram or whatever uh, that's really cool i might have that bookmarked I'm, I'm not sure but it looks familiar no really yeah yeah i've gone to it a bunch um but i think i i'm definitely gonna start i think i'll start using that uh crayon resource uh, it's pretty neat All right. Um, so last week, next week is the last week, huh? Uh, oh, and it's not working. <laughs> this is website down. Or something. Interesting. Yeah. So one one chapter uh, loads for me. Oh really? It's not redirecting properly, huh? Is this the same uh, URL? So I know you had like a couple of version yeah. book. I yeah, I think that's yeah, it's the same. That's weird. Uh... <laughs> well, we'll get it at some point in time. Oh, I guess I can't present it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm well, just set this whole thing up. You turned your internet off, and I think it's my browser. I don't know why Firefox is doing that. Um, but yeah, so I think I am presenting next week. Uh, and that's my last one. Uh, I know we talked about like doing like some kind of a uh showcase thing uh i might try to put something together for c i don't know um we'll see but um maybe we can talk cool. about it next time um but yeah hope you guys have a good evening um mike are you still doing the, the other book club is that next uh it's weird because uh, uh the last chat message i saw was the end of january when eric said he had to cancel and then that's been it. And it's been like three weeks of crickets. I already told them that I was probably not going to be participating fully, but um, I was never really a key player in that anyway. So it's not like I had any real influence on the rest. And like I said, Eric had something set up and then pushed it off, but I don't see any updates since late January. So um, okay. congratulations to you guys and uh, Jake on getting to the end of this one. <laughs> it's been a journey yeah uh i feel like i've learned a ton i mean uh i hope you guys have too um yeah yeah it's been good and useful lots of stuff to learn um yeah well worth the thursday nights yeah i feel like I, I i've learned about things that i want to learn more about i don't feel like i've really become comprehensively good about anything but at least I have some ideas of things out there, ideas out there that I really want to master. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of stuff that you just need to kind of like do a project with, you know, like I think for me, that's uh, like the classes stuff is kind of like that. Um, I don't write a lot of code that like has my own classes. And I was actually thinking about that the other day, like trying to like, I was writing a bunch of functions that like had a bunch of like if else statements. And I was like, oh, if I just wrote subclasses for each type of object, it's like a similar thing, but it's slightly different. Like, if I, you know, so if the object had a class, then maybe I wouldn't have to write a million if else statements. And I don't know, but still like need to work on that. But, uh, but yeah, but thanks. Thanks for you guys, like for sticking through it. It's been, it's been good so far and we have one more. 
And when we're, we'll, we'll have a beer ready for uh, to pop. Yeah. In. Hey, I I have wine usually, so. Uh, yeah, I've got wine tonight, but I'm ahead I'll of make you. sure to have a beer. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that'll be good. Okay. All right. Thanks so All much. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jorge. Thanks, Jorge. Yeah. See you guys. Have a good night. Bye. Have a good night. Yeah.